So I'm glad to be here. It's a great blessing. I, I developed this lecture originally in Thessaloniki because a friend of mine was in charge of elder hostel groups. And he would gather these groups and have me come and talk to him a little bit about Byzantine iconography. And in, in the West, people are not very comfortable with icons. They're more or less iconoclasts. Um, and so by giving this lecture, it opens up a new world uh, and a very incarnational world. Unfortunately, theology in our day, which used to be the queen of sciences, uh, now has become mythology, and science has taken over as the source of truth in our world. Uh, but, I mean, fiction writers, don't fiction writers tell us something about truth? Don't they reveal hidden things to us? So uh, they don't have the corner on the market on truth. And in today's world, faith has really become subjective, but in orthodoxy, we have incarnational truth and that's what iconography is about uh, the spiritual becoming taking on flesh and dwelling amongst us uh, people don't realize that everybody has faith even the atheist has faith that there is no God uh, but God has so positioned himself in the universe that he can be neither denied nor apprehended without faith neither side can convince the other side uh, but that's okay. So I want to share with you a little bit about uh, Byzantine iconography. I was privileged, as Dennis said, to study in Greece uh, for six years. I studied with a monk, Father Paul Politis, uh, twice a week. We'd meet in the shadow of a ninth century church, like the old days with the master teaching the students. And uh, we'd, we'd paint, he'd demonstrate, we'd do critiques. And uh, for three years, I was his student. Every so often when we were meeting, a gruff, grisly, bear-looking man would come in and talk in hush tones to Father Paul and be very skirtive and disappear. And, and we, one day I asked him, who's that? And he says, that's Kostafotiades. He's my teacher. Well, Father Paul got whisked off to Mount Athos after three years, and I was orphaned as a student. Uh, so. He suggested that I ask Costa Fotiades to take me on as a student, uh, which he did. And it's a good thing I had three years with Father Paul. Father Paul was kind of a gentle soul, but Costa Fotiades was not. He did give me one compliment in three years of studying with him, uh, of a portrait of a portable icon of St. George. He said, that's a curious expression. His wife told me, Hang in there. He thinks you have promise. So I hung in there, and uh, by God's grace, I'm still painting. So that's, that's glory to God. All right, now let's start, since this is about iconography, and iconography is a visual language, let's talk about visual language. Uh, every culture has their own spoken language, and if you don't understand the language, it's really hard to penetrate the culture, to really get the meaning, uh, any clear meaning or deep meaning from a culture. So the same with visual art. Visual art is a visual language. Uh, what we express through our images is what we believe about the universe, why we are here. Just as the spoken word falls on our ear a certain way, has a certain rhythm, a certain feel, a certain sound, uh, a certain personality, if you will, so too visual images have their own character. So we, we have subject matter, but we also have personality. So here we see early cave paintings. Uh, and obviously it was the women and they were doing the hunting. We go to the Egyptian period and we have a very sophisticated uh, visual language. To us it might look rather primitive. We have uh, oops, go back, I missed the button. Okay, there we go. We have frontality, that is the shoulders are facing us, combined with profile in the same image. They maintain the integrity of the two-dimensional surface. They have a symbolic language, that is, they emphasize importance by scale. Here the servants are down below. The, the pharaoh and his wife are the big ones. The visitor, the cupbearer, comes bringing a gift. And then they have a written language. 
The Greeks, of course, were interested in uh, logic, in beauty, in mythology. Um, so that's part of their visual language. We jump ahead to the Impressionists. Here we have Renoir. This was the time of the existentialists when the big idea was to be in the present. What do we experience in the present? How does light fall on my eye? Not expressing big uh, eternal ideas, but ideas of the moment, and those are carried over into the visual art. Wassily Kandinsky, a Russian, raised in a Russian culture, which is a dominant Orthodox culture of the time, uh, came up with a new way of looking at art. And if you didn't understand this, you'd look at this and dismiss it. You'd say, well, my grandchild could do that. Well, maybe your grandchild could do that, or better than that. But he opened new worlds in art. And in this case, it was art, experience in art the same way we experience music. We don't ask, what is it? We are moved in the soul, the depths of our soul, by the imagery. And so now he's taken away from object, art, into non-objective art. And that opened up all kinds of doors for expression. So when it comes to orthodox theology, everything we do is affected by our theology. The way we dress, the way we eat, uh, the way we build our churches. We build our churches facing east. Uh, because light comes from the east, darkness comes from the west. So when we're buried, we're buried facing the east in anticipation of the resurrection. So everything really is influenced by our faith and our beliefs. Here we have the church of Gretzanitsa, and it's very humble on the outside, stone materials, plain, simple, uh, the same way the Christian should be not pretentious, simple on the outside, but decorated with virtues and the church itself is decorated with beautiful iconography. Two things that need to be present in order for something to be a Byzantine icon is one, the subject matter. Here we have Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. The other is the way something is painted. In the same way a Christian life you have orthodoxia, that is correct worship, and orthopraxia, how we live. So those two elements are necessary. So we would call this a religious painting of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. We wouldn't call it a Byzantine icon. Byzantine iconography is a unique visual language in the history of art. It brings together two streams of perception. Um, we have the, what we take from the East, and this is similar in, in a way to the, to the uh, Egyptian painting in that they maintain the integrity of the two-dimensional space. They don't break that two-dimensional barrier. Uh, they have a symbolic language, and in this we see the Virgin Mary is a head taller than Saints Peter and Paul. That's not a physical description, but it's rather a spiritual description saying she was more important in this case. We see the two important figures on the central axis, Christ, and this is in the icon of the Ascension, and the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is the only one with a halo amongst the apostles because at the holy, uh, at the uh, incarnation, at the um, Evangelismo, the Annunciation, the Holy Spirit descended upon her. And uh, so she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost had not yet come, so the apostles do not have their halos yet, halo being a symbol of enlightenment. We see also behind her a burning bush, a bush that is on fire. We've heard of a burning bush before. That is Moses and the burning bush. It was on fire, but it was not consumed. So the Virgin Mary was on fire with God, but she was not consumed. When we come to Holy Communion, we receive the body and blood of Christ. We are on fire with God, but we are not consumed. Another aesthetic element, you'll see that the apostles are stacked one on top of another. That's almost like a child would do in art. They're not unaware of boundaries. They're saying, this is important. I need to show this person. So we'll just stack them up one on top of another. We also see Christ in his uh, mandala that is shown in his glory. And whenever we see that in like the transfiguration, the resurrection, the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary, he's shown in his glory. 
Uh, other times, like the baptism or the raising of Lazarus, he's not in his mandala, but in these situations he is. But we see that it's very sophisticated, that this shows translucent, that the figures are underneath, so you can see through. Um, the other thing is that these figures are frontal, and uh, there's strong element of linear design. So these are some of the elements that are taken from the East. From the West, and that's the Hellenistic art form, we take, here we have in this one icon, we have Eastern, we have Western, and we have Byzantine. So from the East, we have that frontality, the expressive faces, we're not rendering nature, but we're creating expressive images, big eyes. Here we have rendered and foreshortening the angels. So that's something that's foreign to Byzantine icons. But the, the modeling of form, and here in the Virgin Mary, the classical pose, uh, the modeling of form, the big expressive eyes, that came together to form the Byzantine, um, Byzantine visual art. And that is very important because it really is uh, an art form that matches with the theology of the church and the experience of church. When we enter a church, uh, of course there were many generations and developments of architecture from the time of uh, the, th the early 4th century, 312 AD, at the Edict of Toleration by St. Saint, by Saint Constantine, Constantine the Great, when he moved the empire from Rome to uh, Byzus, Byzantium, and named it the new city, Constantinople. Um, from that point on, the church had the backing of the state. And so things like architecture, iconography, uh, scholarship, all that began to develop. It was no longer a church in persecution. Uh, this, what we see here, is a development that was really codified after the iconoclastic period. I'll say something about that in a few minutes. But the iconoclastic period, when that ended, then we see the form that we have today for the layout of a church. If you, as you enter the church, you're leaving time and space and you're entering eternity. Um, so when you come to the base of the dome, you find Christ, the Pando Krator. Pando, everything. Kratao, I hold. So I hold everything in my hand. I am the Almighty. So he is Christ the Almighty, the beginning of time, the second person of the Trinity took, taken on flesh. Then we come down into uh, the drum of the church, and we have the first order of created beings, the angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, and then below that, we have the next order of created beings, and that is the patriarchs, fathers, and prophets of the church. Here we see Christ with his right hand, he blesses, spelling out his name, I-C-X-C, -C, and you'll see that formation in other, uh, other areas when we, when we see other icons of saints. Uh, so with his right hand, he blesses. With his left hand, he holds the book of the gospel. And his colors, red and blue, are the same colors that we see on the Virgin Mary, but on the Virgin Mary, those colors are reversed. She has uh, red on the outside, a symbol of divinity, blue on the inside. So at the incarnation, her humanity was wrapped in divinity. And at the incarnation's Christ, divinity was wrapped in humanity. We also see that Christ has a halo, but he, of course, is the only one with a cross in his halo, for obvious reasons, the crucifixion. And in his halo, he has the Greek participle, o on, that is, the one who is. Remember back to Moses in the burning bush, who are you? I am who I am. I am the source of being, the source of life. Around the outside of the medallion of the Pandakrata, we have a verse from Isaiah. And this is a verse that the bishop says just before the reading of the epistle when he's celebrating the divine liturgy. He calls out, Lord, Lord, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vineyard which your right hand has planted and you have established. And they're talking about this church, this concrete church that God has established. And this is a close-up. This is actually a church that I painted in Augusta, Georgia, from 1999 to 97. Uh, they had a fire shortly after I left, and uh, 
it, it didn't burn, but it was very smoke damaged. Uh, so they had to clean it and repaint quite a bit of it to repair it. And then here is the prophet Elijah. This is in the, the drum below. At the base of the dome, uh, in typical Byzantine style architecture, there is what we call a pendentive that was developed uh, by Justinian in the, the I think, believe it was the 5th, 6th century when they built Hagia Sophia. They needed a way to get the dome, the symbol of, uh, the symbol of state power, onto the square, the symbol of church power, which was the basilica. That was the kind of churches they had. And so they developed the architectural feature called a pendentive. And that is the triangle that joins the circle to the square. Well, it is structurally the foundation and the pillar that holds up the dome. So naturally it became the source and place for the pillars of the church. So in those particular places in the pendentives, we place the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four pillars of the church. Physically, the dome is connected to the earth through the apse. So in the apse, we have the icon of the Virgin Mary. This is titled the Platiter ton Uranon. That means more expansive than the heavens. She created within her, she contained within herself the creator of the universe. Uh, and therefore she is more expansive than the universe. Uh, theologically, this is an important icon because we see Christ as a child, but he has a mother. He is O'on, but he is perfect man. So perfect God and perfect man. This is in a chapel that I painted in uh, Mexico City, a private chapel. And then we have the archangels. Michael and Gabriel in adoration. In the poetry of the church, we call her the ladder on which God descended because of her yes at the Annunciation. She took on, uh, the Holy Spirit depended, uh, descended upon her and she bore the second person of the Trinity. This is in uh, Hagia Sophia in Oak Ridge and uh, it shows a typical layout or design for a church if you have the space in the room you have the icon of the Virgin Mary you have Christ giving his body and his blood to the Apostles and then you have the concelebrants so if you have the architectural space that's the layout that you follow something interesting about this is that you see Christ here in his mandala and that means showing him in his glory and the bishop said well that separates him that he shouldn't be in that. So they covered it up, they repainted it, just the way you saw it in the image in Mexico, Christ sitting in the lap of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and then years later, the, uh, some Bulgarian conservators came and discovered that it was there, so they carefully removed it, put it off to the side, and now you can see both icons, the original one and the one that they covered up with. Another interesting feature here that you will notice is that Christ here is standing behind the tabernacle and just like a James Escher drawing his arm is in front of the pillar so that you have a little optical illusion there but that's to say that we don't follow the laws of nature we follow the laws of a spiritual reality and it would just just to follow physical reality and interrupt the hand of the master would not make sense so we put it in front of the pillar. These are the concelebrants. The bishops uh, stand in Christ's place as the authority, as the visible representation of Christ when they celebrate the divine liturgy. And on their shoulders they have the omophorion, almost his shoulder. So that is their symbol of authority as the good shepherd carried the lamb on his shoulders, so too the uh, bishops of the church carry the responsibility for their flock. So the rest of the garments, the vestments that he's uh, wearing are similar to the way priests vest today. They have the stichadion, the undergarment, the epitrachilion, that's the uh, garment whenever they wear, do a sacrament, the philonion, the outer garment, and then they have cuffs, and uh, they also have the uh, epigonation, 
that is uh, uh, awarded to someone, a priest who is a, uh, an economos, that means an economist. In the old days, they would collect the money and put it in the back and then distribute it after the liturgy to the poor. So the vestments are very similar to the priests. They are the proclaimer of the gospel. You see the hands blessing in the name of Christ. Uh, and they're all dressed in what we call polistavri, that is the many crossed vestment and each design is just a little different in terms of its cross design. This is in uh, uh, Joachim and Anna, painted by the Astropa brothers. They were, during the Paleologan period, very productive and prolific artists. Uh, and, and up until the point that they started painting, we really didn't find works of art signed by the artist. Um, it, was through the, it wasn't even through the hand of, it was schools that would paint things, so we don't really know who the artists are for the most part. But these, uh, these Astrapa brothers, they were kind of clever young men, and uh, they did advertising. They would put their initials on the hilt of the swords. Uh, they would put in their names in the back of the emperor's vestments. So it started appearing, uh, they, we call that marketing, so they, you know, they were very clever, clever young men. They lived, uh, uh, my teacher was painting a church in Thessaloniki, and I would visit him there, and he said, the Estrabah brothers, they lived two blocks up and two blocks over. That's how old uh, the city of Thessaloniki is. The church is divided into three parts. We have the narthex, and that is that area of transition from the world into the, the, the ark. They call the church the ark. After Noah and the ark, it is the place of salvation. You come away from the storms of this world uh, for salvation. So the narthex is that area of transition. The nave is where the congregation sits. And then the holy of holies is separated by the icon screen. In the early days, it was a gate, a low gate with pillars. And on the pillars were icons. And then there were curtains in between that they would open and close depending on uh, where they were in the liturgy. Eventually, the icons came down in between the pillars, and this is the form that you'll find in any Orthodox church. The doors, they call it the holy doors because the priest, the ordained clergy, deacon, priest, and bishop are the only ones that go in and out of the holy doors, um, and they bring out uh, the mysteries, the body and blood to the people. This design is very similar to the, the temple that they had a place, the Holy of Holies that the archpriest would go in once a year. Uh, they would tie a rope to his leg and put bells on his vestments in case he died in God's presence. They could pull him out. Uh, the bishops nowadays wear what they call a sacco, an outer garment over the top of their vestments, and there's bells, 12 bells rep representing uh, the apostles. Uh, to the left of the holy doors, we have the icon of the Virgin Mary with Christ as a child. To the right, we have Christ as a grown man. This represents the incarnation, uh, the coming of Christ into the world. This represents the second coming of Christ. So in between the Incarnation and the Second Coming of Christ, we have the Church. To the right of Christ, we have John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, and then to the right of the Virgin Mary, to her right, we have whoever the patron saint of uh, the Church is, in this case, St. George. And then, if it's bigger, and it usually is, there will be a, uh, a door on either side with an archangel on it, and those archangels are there to guard the entrance into the Holy of Holies. Uh, it says that it's, it's understood that only men go into the altar, but that's not totally true. Women go into the altar if they've received a blessing or if it's a monastery to clean, and not any man is allowed in the altar. You need to have a reason to be there. Just because you're a man doesn't mean you can go waltzing in and out of the altar. This is in Stavronikita Monastery, and this is a highly developed iconostasis. Again, we have the Holy Doors, the Virgin Mary, and then above it we have the 12, the, the Kayurton, the 12 major feast days, the cross with the Virgin Mary and John, and then up above begins the 12 major feast days, the Annunciation, 
Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary, and hi the hierarchy of architectural space is once you come down into the church, you leave the dome, then the top registry is reserved for the 12 major feast days. As you come down further into the church, you might have the life of Christ, the miracles of Christ, uh, the parables of Christ, then the saints, women on the left, men on the right, you might have bishops, you might have monks, you might have soldiers, you might have aristocrats, and then you come down into the church itself where you have uh, the, the church militant, that is, the people who are living surrounded by the church triumphant. And here we have proskinitaria, that is, you come and venerate these icons, and over here we see a miraculous working icon. This is actually a mosaic uh, that they had discovered in the sea. There were fishermen out fishing, they pulled in their nets, and they pulled in this icon and there was a shell embedded in the head. You can see the crack right there in the head. So they pulled the shell out and it began to bleed. So they realized that it was a, a miracle working icon so they built a monastery there. And now it's called Stavronikita, the victory of the cross. This is in Osius Lucas, not named for Saint Luke the evangelist, but for Saint Luke, a ninth century monk. And again, you see Christ, the Pandocratera, the Virgin Mary. Uh, there's not a lot of iconography here. It's marble design, uh, but up towards the top, we see more iconography. It's all mosaic. It's very beautiful. Uh, they did a very clever thing in this church. You see these corners here. Well, they have corners with an arch at the top. So it's a very complicated architectural space but they've developed an icon, and as you look at it, it looks like it's flat. It's a very beautiful church. This is uh, from Thessaloniki in our home parish, and we see here's an icon screen. So what we see is behind the icon screen, so we know that it is integral. Whatever's there is related, has to be related to the divine liturgy. So here we have an Old Testament scene understood in the light of the New Testament and that is Abraham and Sarah, the visitation of the three angels. Here is Abraham with his knife about to slay Isaac. The fire is built and the angel stops him. Uh, we remember the story that there were three visitors. There were three angels. We call it the philoxania to Abraham, the hospitality of Abraham. And uh, after the baptism of Christ, where we now understood God as God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now we come back and we reinterpret and understand this visitation of the three angels as a manifestation of the Trinity. So theologically, we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Son and the Holy Spirit are bowing to the Father, so there's hierarchy within the Trinity, but there is unity. They're wearing each a red vestment. So it's three persons in one essence. So the programs that developed after iconoclasm uh, included about 20 different sources of material for developing imagery within the church. And that includes images from the Old Testament. Here we have uh, an icon of the Nativity of Christ. Icons do two things. They, they teach the faithful, that is, they're didactic. They teach us the theology. Of course, in the Middle Ages, uh, learning and study was kept to the monasteries. The general populace was illiterate, uneducated, so they could understand through the images, through the pictures, uh, also through the chanting. Ex explanations through the hymnography, the reading of the gospel and the epistle, the preaching by uh, the clergy. So there are many ways to communicate the theology of the church. Another uh, way they communicated was ontologically. That is, uh, in the hymnography of the church, we say today, Simeron Christosianate, today Christ is born. Remember, God transcends time and space. So as we celebrate those services, we see ourselves as present at the event. And this, this uh, is strengthened, this perception is strengthened by 
the uh, art of Byzantine iconography. In the, uh, in the West, they developed this very sophisticated means of creating the illusion of depth. They would break the two-dimensionality and create atmosphere and space going off into the horizon. But in uh, orthodoxy, we use uh, perspective differently. We used it re in reverse. So something would be larger at the back and smaller at the front. So it would come away from the surface. So it would, rather than you becoming a viewer of an event, when, when we use, when we break that two-dimensional plane, we become an observer. But with iconography, because it comes out to us, we become a participant. And that's why the visual language of iconography is so profound. It isn't the invention of a single person. Somebody didn't dream this up, write a book, and disseminate it. It was more a cultural understanding and expression of faith. So theologically speaking, we, we uh, have a lot of different elements in this icon. We have Christ wrapped in grave clothes and placed in a tomb for telling why he came into the world. We have the ox and the ass recognize their master. They're the first to minister to Christ, keeping him warm on the school night. We have the cave. This is the darkness of this world rather than a stable, he's always depicted in a cave, that he came into this darkness of the world. We have the Virgin Mary, and she's not looking at Christ. She's looking off in this direction. What, she do, what she's doing is she's praying for Joseph, because Joseph is usually placed over here. The artist has switched these two scenes, but she would be looking at Joseph, praying for him, and he is not part of the incarnation, so he's set aside and he's always shown with a look of consternation on his face, wondering, should I put her away quietly? Because if everyone finds out she's pregnant, she'll be stoned. Uh, and that's when the angel of the Lord says, this is of the Holy Spirit. Here we have the daughter of Joseph. He was an elderly man. And uh, this is Salome, his daughter, the midwife, and they're giving Jesus a bath. Here we have the visitation of the Magi, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the proclamation to the shepherds. So it, it conveys a, a whole theological understanding of the incarnation. It, it's not just a historic snapshot. It covers a, a, a long time period, but it conveys to us the meaning of the incarnation. And on the Virgin Mary, you'll notice, if you can see it, there's three stars, one on her helmet and one on each shoulder. That's indicating she was virgin before birth, during birth, after birth. Uh, Salome was a da daughter of a widowed Joseph and uh, had the Virgin Mary had other children at the crucifixion, Jesus would not have been compelled to entrust her to John the theologian. But because she was ever Virgin Mary, he said, mother behold your son, son behold your mother. In Jewish custom, if she had other children, she would have gone to live with those children. These are uh, contemporary icons by my teacher in uh, Vasilisa, Ai Anastasia Pharmacolitria, Saint Anastasia the pharmacist. And she's shown here with an apothecary jar. We know she's a martyr, she's holding a cross. We see also three women martyrs. Uh, you'll see this is a typical expression of martyrs holding up their hand saying, I will not deny Christ. So we know the cross and the hand indicates that these are all uh, martyrs. Here's the empress who was the patron uh, who paid for the monastery. She's offering it to the Virgin Mary. And then above we have two registries of icons and these are scenes from the Passion of Christ. So we see here Christ before uh, Caiaphas, who's tearing his garment, saying Christ blasphemed, and here we have uh, Pontius Pilate. He's washing his hands of the matter. Here we have the Virgin Mary, and Christ is in his mandala, but this is called the Virgin Mary of the Sign, and that was from the prophecy in Isaiah that uh, that you will behold a virgin who will bear a child. So that's the, the reason that he's shown in his uh, mandala. And these are close-ups. 
and a close-up. In this style, this particular technique is known as the Paleologan technique. So I'll say more about that. Now, icons were not always welcome in the Orthodox Church. There was a per period of about 150 years, beginning in 736, when King Leo III, he was the Assyrian emperor, he was raised and influenced by the Muslim culture, and uh, he read in the Bible that you shall have no idols before you. So he considered that the depiction of God as man as an idol and uh, a graven image. So he removed the icon of Christ above Halki Gate, kind of to test the waters, see what kind of response he got. And uh, with that began the iconoclastic period, the ikonomachi, the war against icons. So this was a very distressing time. A lot of icons were destroyed. A lot of people were killed. Um, so whenever that happens, whenever there's controversy, the uh, two sides articulate what it is they believe, why icons, those for icons, those against icons. St. John of Damascus and St. Theodore the Studite articulated the faith, the theology behind icons. Why were icons not only a helpful thing for the Orthodox Church, but an absolutely necessary and essential element? And that is they used an incarnational theology. The second person of the Trinity took on flesh and dwelt among us. He had a prosopon, he had a face. So we depict him just like the emperor has a coin. The coin is just a piece of metal, but it has the image of the emperor stamped in it. So it has the power of the empire behind it. So the person is represented and depicted through the image. So it was an incarnational uh, understanding why do we depict the saints then? They weren't God. Well, in the Orthodox Church, the goal of uh, Orthodoxy, as stated by St. Athanasius in the fourth century, is that God became man so that man could become God or like God. In other words, we are created in God's image and likeness. Image reflects his creativity, his capacity to love, his capacity to reason, his capacity to have relationship. Likeness is the potential. We were all given the potential. Adam was given the potential to become like God. And that reflects process. So uh, we are created in his image and his likeness. Those who've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit and oftentimes their, their, their bodies would perform miracles. They would give off myrrh because they were uh, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. They were made holy, made beautiful. We depict them. We don't worship them. We worship God alone. But saints point by their life, by their example, by their writings. They help us draw closer to Christ. And, and we all do it. We ask one another, please pray for me, or I'm having a hard time. So we ask the living to pray for us. Well, we know that death is just a door. We all have to go through it. For orthodoxy, death is not the end. We go from this life into eternity, and so the saints go into God's presence. So just as we don't take our relatives off the wall when they die, we keep their pictures up, so too we put the pictures of our relatives, those who have uh, achieved holiness in this life. And so just as we ask the living to pray for us, we also ask saints to intercede for us. We have to have two women to thank for the resolution of the iconoclastic period, Empress Irene, called the Seventh Ecumenical Council, 787. And uh, the first year they tried to ha hold it, there was, there was too, much, uh, too much ruckus. They were gonna upset it. They weren't gonna let them have it. So they waited a year, had it the next year, and there they presented uh, and passed the law that icons were an essential part of the Orthodox faith. Well, the next emperor came in and outlawed it for another 50 years, and we have Empress Theodora restoring icons, and we celebrate on the, that on the first Sunday of Lent, the restoration of icons. 
and we process around the church carrying our icons and then read a proclamation uh, uh, proclaiming that this is the faith of the universe, that everyone should believe that icons are part of the Orthodox faith. So with the resolution of the iconoclastic period, we have uh, the people that who for 150 years hadn't been painting now are going back to decorating churches. Uh, so we have that program of iconography begin to be developed. The period known from the 10th, 11th, 12th century, we call that the Komimnon period, named after Komimnos, the emperor. And that period was characterized by uh, these images that were very, very expressive. They had a strong emphasis on linear design. You can see these are expressive faces. We're not, not painting a photograph by any means, but we're trying to capture uh, an expressive image of the saint. And if you can see here, think of this as a marble sculpture. You can see how skilled the, these artists were in articulating the form that this piece of hair captures light here and it curls underneath this piece. So that part's in shade. Light is over here, this side is in shadow. Uh, they really knew how to paint. They didn't have, uh, didn't have slide projectors and computers and uh, all kinds of things to make them great artists. They were great artists. This is in Pania Mavrotisa in Castoria. It's a scene from the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary and you can see here these very dramatic figures stepping out, uh, very articulate, very expressive faces and that's what characterized this period. This is in uh, uh, Corbinovo, it's in St. Pandelemon in uh, Skopje and uh, here we have the f uh, Christ coming down from the cross on the bier. And here it's almost as if he's levitating, uh, the embrace of the Virgin Mary showing his, her love for his son. Again, we defy gravity. What's more important is the spiritual reality. Following the Komimnon period, the emperor began to decline. Times were tougher. We see a greater emphasis now and influence of the Renaissance period too, we see a greater emphasis on Christ's humanity. We see more of a photographic-like image begin to emerge and develop. This is in the Theses from uh, Constantinople and Hagia Sophia. This is the Virgin Mary, Christ, and Saint John. This is shorthand. Whenever you see this combination of iconography, it's shorthand for the icon of the second coming of Christ. Um, it, it would show uh, the apostles on the 12 thrones. Uh, the, the, it would show the angels and it would show the judgment, the second judgment. So this is shorthand for the second coming of Christ. And there's a close up. And this is in actually in mosaic. So you can see the mastery of color and form, the transitions from light uh, to dark, from warm to cool, just the beauty. This is actually in reflected light, what control and sophistication they had in their artwork. Following the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in the uh, 1453, 15th century, mid 15th century, um, all the iconographers, of course, no longer had jobs in the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople. They fled, they congregated in Crete, Crete was under the uh, influence of the Venetians at the time, so they were allowed to continue their art. Uh, we see a dramatic change here in the style. Now it's gone back to a very graphic style, very dramatic, positive colors. These were hard times, so we try and put out something positive. Uh, very quickly painted, that may be an economic influence. Uh, but we also see Western elements begin to creep into the iconography because of uh, the patrons were now from the West. Uh, so this went on for another couple hundred years. These are by Theophon the Cretan, who painted uh, with his two sons. They all were monks, became monks. And these were from the uh, church of uh, Stavro Nikita on Mount Athos. The, uh, the Russians became Orthodox in 987 AD when uh, uh, Prince uh, Vladimir went to 
Constantinople. They sent out, uh, Queen Olga sent out her emissaries to try and find what religion should we believe in. Well, they went to Constantinople and the famous saying is that I didn't know whether I was in heaven or on earth. It was, I was so taken up by the liturgy. Uh, so the Russians became Orthodox. They celebrated a, a thousand years in 1987. And uh, shortly after that, uh, Theophan the Greek, he was trained in Constantinople, 14, 13th, 14th century. Uh, he went and he began to paint in Russia and train the Russians in the Byzantine uh, technique. You'll notice these figures are much taller than the t traditional Byzantine. The Byzantine figures are eight to ten, eight, eight, seven to eight heads high. These are 10 to 11 heads high, very elongated, very dramatic but still they follow the Byzantine uh, nootropia, this Byzantine way of thinking. And uh, the famous student of Theophan the Greek, of course, is Andrei Rublyov, Saint Andrei Rublyov, and uh, he was a magnificent painter and influenced generations of iconographers to come. These are some portable icons, just to give you a feel of some of the masterpieces throughout the world. Portable icons were important in the church, we had wall icons uh, painted and decorated the interiors of church and church architecture really, and we have to get our architects to understand this, the architecture of the church really is to create spaces for the iconographer. And that's why we have all these arches and all these walls, we bring the space down to the iconographer. So it makes me upset when these modern architects put big windows right in the side of a beautiful wall. They punch a big hole in it and, and ruins the space for iconography. Um, but portable icons were important in uh, the liturgy of the church because they like to process, they venerate icons. Uh, also, the, every Orthodox was encouraged to have a home church so they would have a place uh, where they would put up icons, they would have a candle burning, they would say their prayers at night so that the home church would sanctify uh, the home with the presence of God and the saints. So here's a, a portable icon of Christ, it's a Komimnon style from Cyprus, uh, 12th century. This is Christ of the fiery eye, a Russian icon. The interesting thing about iconography is we're not trying to copy a perfect physical form of Christ and just get better and better and better at the actual physical reality of Christ. That's not the point. The point is to transcend in every generation, to transcend that, to bring the viewer into a spiritual relationship with Christ. In the 11th, 12th century, the uh, Byzantine Empire was in its heyday. They, everyone had money, they were powerful, they were wealthy. Well, in 1204, after the sack of Constantinople, early 13th century, now the empire was on the decline and Christ now begins to look more human. In the Komimnon period, Christ is stern, powerful, to keep people in check because they were so wealthy. You lose your mind when you have all that wealth. Well, when you need comfort, now we see Christ's human side depicted. So we see a more compassionate, God. So every generation has a different spiritual need. Uh, I used to paint in the Komimnon style. My teacher, this is the artist in me coming out, he told me, he showed me the Komimnon style and he says, this is the acme, this is the height of Byzantine iconography. So I started to paint that way. Well, people didn't like that style. People did not warm up to it. It was kind of an acquired eclectic taste. And they let me know that in no uncertain terms. So when my career was about to come to a screeching halt, I began to listen and I changed. And now I do a style that is more approachable, more accessible uh, to people. This is a famous encaustic icon. Uh, it's, it predates the iconoclastic period. We don't have many examples because most of them were destroyed. Uh, this is unique, Mount Sinai, very famous icon. If you hold up your hand and cover up half of the face, half of the face is an expression of anger and judgment. The other half, even down to the mouse, mouth, is an expression of compassion. So in this image, the iconographer has showed that God is perfect, 
love and perfect truth. And that's why he can be our judge. It's a very famous icon of Archangel Michael in the Athens, uh, Athens, Greece, the Byzantine Museum. Very beautiful pal example of Paleologan uh, icon, iconography. There's just several samples of different portable icons. Raising of Lazarus. The Odigitria. This is the Psychosotir. This is the soul saver. Uh, people would give terms of endearment to different icons, so they would develop uh, different traditions of naming icons. Now, iconography, uh, in order to paint a portable icon, there's a lot of steps you have to go through to get it ready. Uh, we start with wood. Wood is a living substance, so we cover it with cloth, linen, or cotton to give it some, because it moves and changes with humidity, you have to give it a, some flexibility, otherwise it would just pop off the surface. So we cover it with linen cloth and rabbit skin glue, and then we gesso it. It takes about 10 coats of liquid hot rabbit skin glue to gesso it. And of course, in the 14th century, we didn't have Black & Deckers. We, they had to scrape it with a blade by hand to make this beautiful surface that you could paint on. Oftentimes, rather than go through that long process of wood preparation, they would just gesso over an existing icon and paint over the top of it. Um, I don't know how they could determine that, you know, that their icon was going to be better than the one they're covering up, but they would make that bold decision. And uh, we took an icon, we had somebody restore an icon in Greece. They brought in a 17th century icon, discovered there were two icons underneath it. So they brought in a 17th century icon and left with a 15th century icon, which was hard to explain at the border. But. Here we have uh, the cartoon that is the linear drawing, and this is, this is if you were the son of an iconographer, that would be your inheritance, uh, the collection, the cache of drawings that you've developed over the years. We tr trace down the drawing, and then we gold gild. This is 23 karat gold with a water gilding technique. You'll see these tools in the exhibit, the gilder's tip, the agate burnisher. We cut the gold, wet the surface, it sticks down because there's this red is clay mixed with gelatin and we wet the surface that activates the gelatin it acts like a glue and then it sucks it into the surface and we're actually polishing not the gold but we're polishing the clay underneath it and that's what gives it that brilliant shine and then we begin to paint we paint from the back towards the front this is process painting it's not impressionism but each it has this hard edge of energy and outline and shape and form. That's what gives it its energy. We know this is an, uh, an event that took place indoors. This is the mystical supper, what we call the Last Supper. And it was a, f a festal time. We see the red curtain indicating uh, a feast day. And that was, of course, the period of the Passover. The table is set. This icon shows the development of flesh tones from the first, second, third, fourth, fourth, fifth, sixth. So you see uh, the process of developing uh, visible reality when it comes to the flesh tones. And there's the finished icon with St. John on the lap of Christ. This, this is uh, the first two phases, just to give you an idea of, of the subtlety and the control we start with a mid-tone call, called a proplasmo or a pre-plasimo, pre, before we plasticize, before we give it shape and form. And then we work with a highlight. We work from the sh highlight towards the shadow. And this is about five layers of the same color, developing ongos, developing volume and shape and form. So you can see what subtlety and control you have. The cheek comes down into the lip. The lip goes down into the chin. Uh, very good control. And you just keep opening it up until you get to white. So you keep adding white to open it up. And then you add shadows to black. And then you have the finished image. This is process painting because we follow the process in developing visual reality. And here are some portable icons that I've done over the years. This is the icon of the Annunciation. And it's what we saw earlier as a vestment 
this trapezoid figure, rhombus, is uh, the epigonation used during the liturgy, part of the vestment. This is in Mexico City. I painted the cathedral. You can see the scale. I'm here in the corner, so it's very large, 20 by 40 feet. Uh, but it's still relational. It's still intimate because of the scale of the architecture. It's a very large space. This is the um, Vasilis Tizloxus, that is the King of Glory. This is called the Extreme Humility of Christ. This is Ayalavra. Again, we see that she's saying, no, I will not deny Christ. And she's holding a cross, and usually they'll have, one of their garments will be red uh, for the blood of the martyr. St. Savas, very famous and important monk for putting together the Tipikon for the Orthodox Church, that is, the order of services. This is Christ the Sotir, the Savior. This is uh, after uh, Pania Donskoyev, which was done by Theophan, the uh, Greek, and we call it the Glicophilusa, the sweet kissing, because of the intimate uh, embrace of the Virgin Mary in Christ. Another example, a version of that. And this is a Serbian example, similar. Ios Nikola, St. Nicholas, great <coughs> saint for seafarers. Uh, you'll find in every Greek uh, harbor a little chapel devoted to St. Nicholas. St. <coughs> Demetrius, patron saint, celebrates his name day October 26. So for a month they have D Dimitria celebrations in Thessaloniki. They have all kinds of cultural events surrounding this feast day. This is the Archangel Gabriel. I, uh, my brother really liked this icon. He's a Baptist. He's married to a Baptist woman. And, and uh, she informed me one time, you know, we don't worship those things. And I said, neither do we. Um, but later, after I'd sent it, they opened it. She, she relayed the story. As she opened it, she began to weep. And it was because it snuck past all her defenses and brought her into the presence of Archangel Gabriel. It's my own version of Christ the Fiery Eye with a Komimnon twist. And this is a very, very important icon from Mount Sinai again, late 13th century. The original has the icon of the crucifixion on the top of it, so two, two icons together. and telling, of course, why Christ came. But this is really the accomplishment of a great society, a great soul, to really capture the beauty and the joy of the incarnation. And this, I brought uh, some icons. I think I have this one to show you. And then this is the chapel I painted. Uh, for seven years, I went down to Mexico. This man had built a chapel in honor of his parents in his backyard. It's a small chapel. You can see the icon screen is built right into the wall, uh, the icon of the resurrection. And above the holy doors, the Trinity. And then to the right, we have the birth of Christ. And then in the altar, the Virgin Mary. And uh, he celebrates once a year the Feast of the Ascension on the 15th, the Dormition, we call it. On the right, we use three feasts from the 12 cycle feast, the Baptism, Transfiguration, Raising of Lazarus, Medallions of Saints. Over here, we have the Annunciation. And then on the other side, the entry into Jerusalem, the Mystical Supper, uh, Christ in the Beer. And then here we have the presentation of the temple in the, uh, of the Virgin in the temple. And then the dome. Here we have Christ the Pandocratida, the angels, seraphim in this case. And then instead of the prophets, because this was a private chapel, a devotional chapel, he put in saints that were uh, important to his family. And then below that we have the 12 gospel or the 12 evangelists, and then the four gospel writers on the ceiling. And you can see a close up. I use Matthew, St. Matthew, and that's the close-up. There's about a meter drop from, he, from here to here, so in order to accomplish this, I painted it on canvas in three pieces and then glued them up overlapping each other and gold-gilded right on site. I don't know how Michelangelo could do anything fancy or even get paint up on the ceiling in any controlled manner. It's just really tough. 
But if you do it on canvas and glue it up, it's much easier. All right. Put you in a dark room with a monotone voice, and it's a formula for sleep. But hopefully you didn't fall asleep. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.